All right, I guess we'll start. It's 10 o'clock. Um, so um, as you heard, um, we have 240 people and more. So that's uh, wonderful. And um, it's great to see everybody signing in. And we uh, are, as I said, we, we are going to do our, our best to make sure everybody gets to ask all the questions they want to ask and get whatever answers there are that exist. Um, the, you know, this is, you know, technology, as I al always say at these member updates, technology is a blessing and it is also, I don't want to say that it's a curse, but it's certainly a challenge sometimes. So uh, please bear with us uh, as, as we go through this. Um, so um, uh, uh, just, you know, exactly two weeks ago, um, we had a uh, special member update to uh, talk about what to do in the, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, since then, you know, a lot has happened in some ways and then in other ways, <laughs> not too much has happened. So, um, but we, uh, we wanted to bring everybody together um, and give uh, updates that we can, tell you what we're doing, give you some information about um, what's going on out in other libraries. And as I said, just kind of give you, uh, give a general update. So um, the, I guess the, the first thing that I wanna, that I wanna say is that um, related to the, the fact that this, you know, we, we did this two weeks ago and the conversation was different, but the same, is that I, I, I can see, and I'm sure that you can as well, that we're going, you know, through different phases of the whole of the of this crisis. At the, you know, two weeks ago, the the questions were about, you know, whether to close, you know, how long to close, uh, suspending delivery, um, you know, curb, you know, whether to offer curbside service. Uh, virtual services, but now we're sort of, you know, moving on or have moved on to worries about uh, staff compensation, uh, you know, property tax collections, revenue, safe materials handling, um, how to have uh, meetings but still comply with the Open Meeting Act. So, it, and you know, it's it'll keep changing. At, at some point, we will get to be talking about reopening, but you know, I we're not there yet. And I, I guess the you know the main the main thing that I want to say is that I I think that this is where it's I think we all know or have to you know come to the conclusion that this just isn't going to stop one day and everything is going to go back to normal you know there's the world is going to be different uh, the way that we serve people is going to have to be different I, you know people are going to be I think I know I will be, am longing to be with other people, but there will also be a lot of fear about being with other people. So it's just, it's so hard to predict. And I think that um, it's impossible to predict. It's unprecedented. And I think that, you know, we have a great community. We, uh, we are known for sharing resources. And I think, uh, you know, we just have to keep taking care of each other. Um, all of our colleagues, our staffs, and our communities, and we will get this, we will get through this together and come out stronger. But I think we just have to acknowledge that things are going to be different and find ways to see that as an opportunity and not so much have, as a loss. Um, so that was, that's the first thing I wanted to say. So um, any comments from anybody at this point? about or questions about anything I said? We're good so far. Okay. All right, good. So um, so we're just gonna go through some, uh, you know, some new developments and uh, some practical considerations. Uh, we're gonna hear from the State Library. We're going to hear from uh, Monica about some virtual services updates and examples. Um, and then we're going to hear from Kate Hall and Betsy Adamowski about some uh, specific issues that they've been dealing with that I think will be in instructive for all of us. So um, everything is still closed. We uh, obviously we are hearing pretty well substantiated rumors, I guess that, but nothing official that the extension of the you know stay at home order is going to be extended well into April. 
um, and uh, even to April 30th. And I think that we just, we should be prepared for that. Um, and um, that, you know, makes everything harder, obviously, um, but we just, you know, again, have to continue to, uh, to stick together. Um, we hope that you've been attending our, our webinars. My goodness, there have been a lot of webinars. <laughs> Everybody's doing webinars. Uh, they certainly, uh, I have found them to be very helpful. Uh, we did one on Friday with IELTS. Uh, there was one that last week that, uh, that uh, Joe and Dan put together with um, speakers from uh, Gail, uh, Gail Borden, no, not Gail Borden, sorry, Vernon Area Library District, as well as from um, HR Source and um, Ansel Blink that answered a lot of questions. Um, so um, th those things I have found very helpful. Um, one of the things that we've had to think about at Rails is, um, and I'm sure you have too, is, is what to do if a staff member gets ill, um, either you know, diagnosed with the virus or just with symptoms. There is um, on our web page on the on the pulse page for the uh, COVID-19. There is um, down um, down a ways under um, what Rails is doing. There is a link to what um, HR source recommends that um, that uh, employers do. So I I would direct you to that and um, also. Um, uh, I'm sure that they would be, uh, HR source would be happy to answer any, um, any further questions as, you know, as time goes on. Um, so let's see. Um, so that's what I wanted to say, I think, about the, um, about the, the, uh, the staff uh, illness piece. I, I would also remind you all that we, um, in, in terms of what we have done, we have had our buildings deep cleaned, and uh, we, we and you know just a reminder if you haven't already <laughs> reminded yourselves uh, that obviously employers have a duty to you know keep the workplace safe, uh, so that you know cleaning would be you know a, a big piece of that. Um, so uh, if you need any assistance in finding any companies that do that. Uh, you know, I'm sure Mark Hatch would be happy to help you. Um, and um, I think that's what I have to say about that right now. Um, any questions at this point? We did have a question about if, if the governor was going to extend the stay in place um, until the end of April. And I, we did hear a rumor about that. I think he might address that today, but we're not certain. Right. Yeah, we don't we don't know anything official, but that is what we hear. And as um, as was just stated in the chat, the, you know, federal guidelines not the same as the shelter in place. But um, yes, they might end up being aligned. Um, and we certainly, yeah, we wouldn't. Eat, um, I don't think any of us would be surprised if if things did get extended and our what we have done on our web page is we have said until further notice just so we don't have to keep changing dates so um, um believe me you'll be the first to hear <laughs> so if we if we are able to reopen and i'm sure we'll we'll hear about you guys as well so um any other questions at this point there is so a question far? about the uh, are the deep cleaners on the on our pulse page. I don't believe we have a list there yet. I know we're going to address the topic later in the agenda. I don't believe there's a list on the pulse page yet. No, there isn't. But we can certainly um, we can work on that. We know that's a huge issue with people. Yeah. If you um, if you go on to the um, in terms of where the HR source link is, if you go to the Rails webpage uh, on, on the Pulse page for COVID nineteen, and you just scroll down, there's a lot of stuff there. But keep scrolling, and you'll see HR policy, HR source policy. Slayton, um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I guess uh, maybe I think that would be a question to ask uh, somebody who knows more about. Uh, cleaning than me. Um, if you if you're going into the building at all, I would think the sooner the better. Um, 
speaking of which we uh, rails we have not been back well most of us 99 percent of us haven't been back to our building since march 16th um, three of us are going in this week to pay bills um, we think that obviously is an essential service we want to keep people um, you want to keep our vendors, especially our smaller vendors, cleaning companies, <laughs> uh, landscaping companies, et cetera. You want to keep them whole if we can. Um, so um, thank you, Kate. Um, so I know that Karen Egan is out there because I saw her on the chat. Is Greg McCormick on by any chance? Wondering if we can move on to the... Uh -huh. D, I'm here on the phone with Joe hey. Natale. Okay, hi Joe, hi Greg. Hello. Um, well. it, are you at the State Library Report? I'm sorry, I was trying to follow on the computer and the phone at the same time. So, um, well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, certainly, the State Library is in the same situation as everyone else. Um, Joe <clears throat> and I have been coming in. On a daily basis, I'm still gathering mail because um, and handling details um, that are ongoing with our operation because we are still receiving a significant amount of material through the Talking Book and Braille service statewide. So um, we received five hampers of digital cartridges this morning again. So. Um, just an update on several things that are going on. So uh, either later today or probably tomorrow, every public library is going to be receiving a survey that is being conducted uh, in conjunction with the Board of Higher Education, the Community College Board, and the State Board of Education um, regarding a mapping project for Wi-Fi access that still exists within the state. Um, we realized in working with the two library systems on data, what is in L2, what may have been reported in the public library annual reports, that all of that may not still be quite accurate. Um, so every school district, um, the, of course the community colleges, every education agency, and now including public libraries, um, will be asked to self-report. The survey will actually go back to, I believe, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. I'm still uncertain about that um, issue, but questions can be uh, sent to Joe and I. So please be looking for that as you're working remotely from home um, regarding that information. And it may prove to be a very, very useful resource statewide. And I'm glad um, that public libraries at least can be inc included in this on, on <coughs> addressing what is going on during this uh, time of the pandemic. Um, we've had a lot of concern to, as well and, and uh, Deidre has raised this question with, um, you know, the issue of the public library per capita grant program. Um, we still have no reason to believe those awards are not going to be made, but simply because of our operations being curtailed right now here at the Secretary of State's office as well, um, we've not been able to finish processing those. We had actually calculated all of those grants and we're ready to move forward when this stay at home order went into place. So, um, but again, I, I don't have any reason to believe that there should be concern about that at this point. Um, all other grant applications, I have to say, and, and I think that, um, you know, a lot will be determined by what the direction is given by the governor. All other grant applications at this time are rather fluid as far as their due dates. Um, we notified um, as best we could certain libraries that had applications due um, for the public library construction uh, grant program. I believe everyone received that information. Um, 
We did not get any notices back, but we will probably be having to do some modification of due dates of grant applications. We were meeting this morning about what was going on exactly with the literacy program and where we were with review of those applications and decisions that will need to be made for FY21. Um, we also did modify and move um, library certification to April 30th. Um, I have been in contact with uh, counting opinions regarding the um, interlibrary loan statistical survey as well and continuing that through April 30th. But again, depending upon what occurs, uh, those dates may have to be changed as well. Um, many of you have probably heard and read regarding um, the stimulus package that went through. There is a provision in there of $50 million for funding for libraries. Um, I will say we nor any state I think exactly knows what that will mean yet. Um, it will go through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. A portion of that at least, my understanding was to be um, a change to the Grants to States program. The funding would be available through September of 2021. Um, so I presume it's just a change to the current grant award that we have. Um, if IPLAR data is fluid. Okay, I did not see that question. Um, so I think we will have to be addressing that as far as when that will be um, do as well. Uh, the governor's executive order and, and changes then to um, anything that existed in rule and law for the Secretary of State's office. There have been modifications filed with emergency rules. We'll have to look exactly where that sits in law or rule and seek a change, um, certainly if that is necessary and probably is so at this point. So that's a very, very good question. Um, at noon today, um, many of you are probably also registered for the webinar that is being conducted by the Institute of Museum and Library Services regarding COVID-19 and handling of library materials. Um, I think that, you know, as, as we attend that, um, and I presume maybe some of the library system staff will, we will make sure that that is shared. It is our understanding that's going to be archived or recorded and archived and available to everyone. Um, another issue that we've been looking at is exactly what is being done regarding the provision of e-resources across the state. Um, again, more specifically within public libraries, what is, are they able to provide, who was, um, enrolled in um, a group purchase who was purchasing items on their own. I think we have fairly good data now from both library systems. And um, for the most part, I have to say a very, very good job on the part of the Illinois library community on providing these and continuing to provide those services to um, libraries. We are, I would, it's, far more than 90% are um, providing those services now, um, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think that we'll see um, more about this in the coming days and coming weeks on, on what we might be able to do as a state. The problem is, of course, right now, um, moving uh, anything right now is a bit difficult, um, not only because of our office, because of what is going on at the state's comptroller's office, et cetera, as far as payments that are being issued by the state as well. So I think more to come with about that. I think this is a significant time of learning for all of our organizations um, on what we uh, are doing now, what we may need to be doing differently in the future. Um, and so I think that it's just a very, challenging time for all of us. 
Um, but I think that we need to certainly um, hold tight, stay the course, and um, we're waiting for more direction from uh, what the governor's office and then, of course, what the federal government says as well. So. Thank you, Greg. Thanks so much for that update. I appreciate you guys um, being here. Um, I want to just uh, follow up on um, something that you said. Can everybody hear me? Just like nod your head so people I can see. Okay. Um, in terms of cleaning of library materials, we, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about that because I think it's, it's not, this is not going to be like a one day or a one time problem. This is, this is going to be something because of the way materials circulate all over the world, et cetera. This is going to be very difficult to get our arms around. So I reached out last week and Monica, it was Monica was, and I were talking about it. And so I reached out last week to some of my consortial colleagues, um, um, and to Jim Neal, who was the president of ALA, as you know, and is very well connected. And so he helped me um, get in touch with IMLS. Um, and um, this is also related to the, uh, obviously they're having this webinar today. Yes, it is full, but uh, several of us are attending. And yes, we will put it up on the website. Um, I am hoping what, I, what Jim and I have asked IMLS to do or to think about doing anyway is to is to take some of that stimulus money or some of their money and and put together a a, a project for to do um, um, you know to come up with really you know definitive standards on how to clean materials and and how not just to clean them once but then like what's the training that staff are going to need over time to you know make sure that that they're clean properly what you know who how just how are we going to keep tabs on this if the if the if the if the problem changes or um you know escalates as i say because of all the resource sharing this is this is something that's going to it's, it's you know it's not going to do any good if one library cleans their materials right so um so um my my understanding is that i just heard from cindy landrum who is the um, director of library programs at IMLS. She used to work in Illinois at the Oak Park Library. How about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but she um, she did um, she has brought this to the director Crosby. Um, and after the webinar, I, I understand that he and Jim and she are going to confer about what might be possibly done to get some, you know, get some control, better information, better planning, I guess, around this. So, um, uh, let you know. So we'll wait and see what happens with that. I'll keep everybody up to date. I'm not by any means promising any miracles on this. Um, and I know that Monica also reached out to the PLA board. They're very obviously concerned about this and they're looking at it um, and maybe some connections there, PLA, IMLS, I don't know. Um, it's not just a public library problem, obviously. Um, that's what I'm concerned about. So um, anyway, that I was gonna talk about that later, but I figured I might as well just tell you now since we were talking about the webinar. And I, you know, I, I see there's a question now from, should we wipe down all books before we open? We're gonna have to do something, but I don't know what it is. And that's why we wanna get some, I'm, I'm worried about anecdotal guidance and, you know, it's, it's fine, but we need to really have, you know, good communication about real standards. We can't, we can't just depend on word of mouth, et cetera. So anyway, that's one of the things that I'm really worried about. Uh, yeah, I, and, and I, I totally agree with that statement. Um, and it, it's a concern across the state. Um, we're very interested here at the state library. I, and I shared um, with Dee about, you know, how many uh, of the talking book items we have that are in plastic cartridges. Um, we have over 20,000 right now on the first floor that have come in since our closure, and we had 56,000 in circulation when the closure went into place. So all of those items are going to need to be cleaned at some point. And we I certainly understand that, you know, all libraries face that. And of course, the cleaning is going to depend 
um, on the type of item that is in circulation and exactly what you can do. It's, so hopefully we learn more today at noon and certainly that that can be disseminated across the state. Right. And yes, I, I mean, I, I, uh, I yeah, it, it, and you're correct. It is going to be an ongoing concern for library operations. Right. Right. Yes. So, um, okay. So that um, is what we know about that right now. And hopefully, um, yeah, time, you know, time heals all, <laughs> I hope. But since we won't know where things have been or for how long they've been, wherever they've been, et cetera, um, and, you know, if they, the virus comes back, like they say that it's going to, you know, whatever. We're, I just would like to get some, uh, some, a real plan around this. So, you know, I love plans. So, <laughs> um, okay. Deirdre, um, we do have a question for Greg about the construction grant. Is the deadline extended for the construction grant? Okay, so for the public library construction grant, there were actually two deadlines for libraries. The first, uh, and not, it didn't apply to all, we had a group of libraries that had applications and carryover um, grant applications from previous years. Um, because we received an appropriation this year, they had a due date of March 31st um, to submit information. Um, all other new application, applicants had a date of April 15. Right now, that April 15 date is holding, but I believe it too is going to have to be extended. Um, what we may have to do though is do that in, in, with an emergency rule change because that is in rule and not um, something that is subject to the state library's discretion. The March 31st date was. So we will be looking at that um, today or tomorrow regarding what needs to be changed. We have a, a meeting this afternoon with all managers of the state library and we're going to go through um, things exactly like that. What um, due dates did we have upcoming? Um, because I too believe our, our reopening um, is probably going to be somewhat delayed. So we will let everyone know as soon as we can. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much, Greg. Any more questions for Greg? or Karen at this moment. I hope you guys will stick around. Uh, Deirdre, someone had questioned earlier on, um, they just said, what about IPLAR? I'm not yeah. sure if they were talking about extension. Yeah, Greg, you wanna just run that, run through that real quick, Greg, about what you said about it being fluid? I think that all of our dates are going to be fluid. We will look at the IPLAR provision and see what the exec governor's executive order currently allows. And if we need to file emergency rules um, regarding the IPLAR, we will do so as, as well. Um, I, I would ask that everyone simply hold tight right now um, and we will get that information out regarding the IPLAR. Um, of course, it will only be probably for this first phase. I would hope that by the time we hit um, July 1, that certainly those <laughs> dates will hold. So, I hope. <laughs> Me too. Okay. All right. So, um, I think we will move on then to Monica to talk about virtual services. Sure, Hi. thanks, Steve. Thank Hi, you. everybody. Uh, my name is Monica Harris. I am the Associate Executive Director uh, at Reels. Uh, and so I am here today just to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on in our 
uh, library communities and we just wanted to be able to share some of those things with you and also encourage you to share what you're doing. So uh, of course while our buildings are closed, uh, our libraries are still serving our communities and we are still open. We're doing so much uh, to make sure that we are meeting the needs of our community and I know I personally have been so inspired to see the creativity that has been on display uh, all over the country but definitely within our own Rails membership. Um, so that's been really wonderful to see so we wanted to be able to share a little bit about that today. Uh, but the other thing, the first thing we wanted to be able to share with you is that in order to be able to make sure that all of our membership sees and shares the wonderful things that you're doing in terms of virtual programs and services, Rails has created a survey uh, that is live just as of this morning. So if you are on the Pulse page, um, which I know all of you are looking at and able to see, um, then you'll see right at the top of that page, um, there is a section that says Rails and Rails libraries. And so the, the kind of first spot that's there is please supply us with information about what virtual services and programs your library is offering during building closure via our survey. And there we are asking you to submit the kinds of things that you're doing uh, to be able to serve your community even as your building is closed. Um, the results are also all going to be available for all of you to see kind of as they come in and you'll see the next link there is that Rails member virtual programming results. Uh, of course, it's not very populated right now because it just started, but if you can start to enter the information that you have, including, if possible, a link to where that's displayed so that we can all share those resources and all learn uh, from each other. I think that's going to be the most valuable thing. Um, I know we're all facing kind of our own individual challenges. I know for me personally, I have a five-year-old on the other side of that door playing Legos that I hope you can't hear too much of, um, but we're all doing our best right now. Uh, and so I think being able to share and see how libraries are approaching this is going to be really valuable for all of us. Um, I wanted to share with you just some of the things that we know are happening out in our communities right now. Um, there's of course tons of stories and songs and finger plays that are going on from youth librarians all over our membership area. People are getting really creative. We're seeing puppets. We're seeing people who are bringing their own children <laughs> into those story times as they can and really being able to see this happen. Um, the survey is of course for everybody and I want to share with you some of the examples that are happening outside of our public libraries as well. Um, a lot of our school librarians are finding ways to share stories with uh, their programs. I know outside of Bensonville Community School District, they're doing story times via Google Hangouts. People are using all kinds of virtual services in order to do that and best practices around those things are being developed very quickly and shared. Uh, so we want to make sure as much as you can that you have access to some of those things as well. Um, we know that at Oregon Public Library, Hillary Lombardo's husband is teaching online ukulele sessions through their library's webpage. Uh, at Messenger Public Library, uh, they're doing Choose Your Own Library Adventure, and I know I've seen several libraries who are doing some of those things where they've been able to add polling to their public to say which direction they want a story to go, and then the story will continue to move in a new direction. Um, again, just different ways that people are using in order to build community and bring people together in a time uh, where people are being feeling very isolated and separate from one another. Um, we're also hearing that people want to see your staff. They miss seeing all of your staff, especially your desk staff that they get to see every single day. Um, and so people are finding ways to just show off what their uh, library workers are reading. People just showing book, uh, you know, uh, photographs with books co covers and being able to to share that people showing off pets I know we've seen that through ILA uh, and what ILA has been doing showing off their working from home spaces um, and it continuing to create that connection. Uh, we also know that there is a ton uh, of people who are in need of job help and unemployment resources. I think libraries did a really good job uh, of being able to respond to that back in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, and we are seeing a whole new wave of that already. So libraries are going to be trying to find creative ways to share those resources and what they're doing to help people uh, through this time. Um, another thing that you all probably already know is that the ALA Executive Board released a recommendation uh, on the 23rd to leave your Wi-Fi open during building closure when possible uh, because many libraries, especially rural libraries, are a critical lifeline to those without the internet. Um, our communities do need that internet now more than ever for job and unemployment resources, e-learning opportunities, oh, and maintaining those community ties during isolation. And we know a lot of our libraries have been doing that. And um, any stories you want to share with us that you know of how that's happening, I 
I think is also very important for us to remember. Um, Rails, of course, serves special libraries as well. And one example we wanted to be able to share with you is that the Kane County Law Library and Self-Help Legal Center converted their walk-in services on divorce and family law to a call-in program that they're being able to offer one-on-one. -on -one. We're really seeing a lot of really interesting things coming through. And I know that this here is just a tip of the iceberg in terms of what you're doing. We definitely want to hear from you. The survey, again, is for every library type. Uh, you will be able to sort results as you're looking through the results to look at the library types that are like your own. So if you want examples from those, uh, the, sort, the results are also sort, sorted by demographic or some of those other uh, opportunities for you to be able to look at it and see uh, what other people are doing and find ways to, to learn from each other and continue to serve our communities as best we can. Um, I think that uh, if there's any questions about this, uh, I'd love to have the opportunity to address them, but I do want to take the opportunity again to thank you all for everything that you are doing in order to be able to serve in uh, some really challenging times. You're doing really amazing work. Thank you, Monica. And yes, let, let me, uh, let me, uh, second what you said. I think that people are doing amazing work and please remember, um, you know, we're not, I mean, obviously here we are, we're all working. We're not closed. We're, we're just not doing business in the traditional way. So, um, you know, that's the message we want to send. We, you may not be able to come into our buildings, but that we have plenty of ways that we can still serve you and we want to. So, um, as I said at the beginning, you know, there's, our business, our business is going to be different, but it's not going to go away. As always, when times are difficult, libraries are more important than ever. So, um, so I think next um, on the agenda is, I think Joe is going to talk about some CE, um, other, some other opportunities and just an update on what's, uh, what's recorded, et cetera. Are you out there, Joe? Sure. I am. Good morning. Thank you, Dee. Good morning, everybody. Um, just going to spend a few minutes really talking about um, and perhaps reminding and also putting on your radar uh, continuing education that's going to be or is available to all of you. Um, first of all, if you missed Friday's um, webinar with HR Source, which was strategies for managing teams remotely, um, that was recorded. It is available through April 12th on uh, the Rails CE archives page. We also will put it on our Pulse page if it isn't there already. Um, this is obviously new for so many of us having to find ways to connect with our staff and manage uh, a team of staff members remotely, not something that we're accustomed to doing. So um, check that webinar out if you're interested. Uh, just a general reminder that we do have a growing archive of recorded webinars and workshops that we'll continue adding to. Those are always available to you on the Rails CE archives page. Um, in terms of those CE opportunities in the weeks ahead, um, we will be moving forward with, with many of the trainings and, and things that we had scheduled before all these closures, closures happened. Um, that includes this week, this Thursday at 10 o'clock, we're gonna be still offering the, the harassment prevention in the workplace um, um, uh, webinar that John Newton is doing for us. Um, that has been something because of the requirements of the, the Workplace Transparency Act that we know that a lot of you are looking for uh, training opportunities that will help you comply with that. So. Uh, again, Thursday at 10, there's still time for you to register for that one. Um, will be recorded and available through the end of the year if it's uh, not a time that you or your staff can participate. Um, also on April 8th, next week, we'll be having still Julie Tappendorf do a webinar uh, related on libraries and privacy laws, uh, specifically the Library Records Confidentiality Act and covering uh, the use of self-serve holds, uh, release of patron information to third-party vendors and contractors. Um, she has agreed to still move forward on that webinar, so we're still going to offer that to you. will be recorded as well. Um, and then just in terms of things that we're working on um, that will be coming to you in the weeks ahead, um, Dee sort of alluded to this, but, um, you know, we've, we've spoken with staff at the Northeast Document Conservation Center. Um, about offering a webinar 
to provide to you all and, and provide guidance on managing our collections during this pandem pandemic, addressing, I think, what some of those most frequent questions that we're seeing on our listservs, and they obviously have some expertise in this area. Um, so they are assembling two or three staff from uh, the Conservation Center to offer that webinar. It should be in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I've also spoken to a couple of presenters on the topics of managing uh, stress and, and just coping st strategies during this you know, very stressful time of uncertainty, uh, of isolation. Um, you know, we, we frequently are wishing each other, you know, safety and good health. And, and a lot of times the, the, what is implied is kind of staying free of this virus, of course, but I think that we need to also extend this to taking care of our whole selves, both kind of physically and mentally. And, uh, that self-care component is something that we shouldn't forget about for ourselves and for our staff. So we're going to see what learning opportunities we can bring you in that area as well. Um, finally, I'll also say that, you know, this is a, I think a time where so many are, are stuck inside that we may have a whole host of people that rediscover or discover reading. So we want to offer some things on Reader's Advisory. And obviously we have great ebook collections that our users can discover new authors and new genres. Um, that doesn't need to stop. So we're going to be working uh, with some of those great Reader's Advisory experts we have working in our libraries to offer some content. And I'll finish by just reminding our members about a week ago um, and then on some listservs and also in our e-news, I put out a form to encourage members who maybe have something they want to share with our membership in a webinar um, to indicate your interest and sort of willingness to do that. Um, open to any and all ideas for webinars um, really going through the spring, but we um, certainly love anybody who wants to share what they're doing related to virtual programming, virtual services, the things that Monica was talking about. We'll be able to share that information through the survey, but it'd also be great to get a panel of, of folks from libraries, different types, to kind of talk about what they are doing in this area. But really, any and all topics we will uh, consider. So I'll put that link uh, in the chat here momentarily. Uh, it could be a great sort of stretch goal for either yourself or for your staff to put together a presentation, and we'd love to give you the platform to do that. Um, so I think I will stop there. Feel free to send me any questions or, or um, any comments in the chat or, or, um, or email me directly. But now I will, uh, I believe, turn things over to Dan Boster, my colleague, who will also talk about some um, networking opportunities. Hi, Joe. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, it's great to see so many people participating. Um, I'm uh, I'm I'm the Rails member enge engagement manager um, participating here from my living room, uh, and you know it's great to see so many people again. Uh, if you were all in my living room, it'd be a pretty tight squeeze. Um, so as Joe mentioned, uh, we have a lot of great learning opportunities coming up. Um, we're all we're we're also cognizant that you need time to kind of digest and connect. Uh, and we have such a great, strong network of interest groups that get together monthly or quarterly. Um, and the only way we can really replicate this, uh, you know, right now is online networking uh, through platforms like Google Hangouts and Zoom. Um, so we, we've offered a couple things. So the first thing is uh, we have something called online roundtables. And uh, these are our long networking events kind of around a specific topic. Uh, we just did one on Friday on tips for hosting online meetings. So if you're uh, thinking about that at home, that's an online meeting about hosting online meetings. Uh, I encourage you to wrap your head around that. Uh, we also have, uh, these include a short presentation by one or more presenters, um, but really the focus is peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So we want everyone to contribute and usually uh, these sessions include like 20 to 30 minutes of facilitated discussion. Um, we also have uh, two of these sessions coming up uh, next week. We're going to be doing tech tips for school libraries, and that's Wednesday, April 8th at 4 p.m. Um, ben Wagoner from uh, St. Charles North High School will be the presenter. And then uh, the next one we have coming up is Thursday, May 14th at 1 p.m. 
uh, Annette Wooden is on solo marketing in the library. Emily Glimco from the Addison Public Library will be doing that presentation. And I should note that we record all of our online roundtables and they're available to watch at any time uh, via our Rails YouTube page. And uh, we're going to be adding some more sessions coming up in the next few weeks. But if you do have a topic and you want to propose something, um, just get in touch with me. Uh, um, I will put my contact information into the chat box in a second here. Uh, the other type of networking that we're doing is less structured. Um, we're hosting these weekly drop-in networking sessions called Rails Online Water Cooler. And the emphasis here is just on mutual support. Um, so if you have a topic you want to talk about, you can sign in and participate. Um, you choose how you participate, either video, uh, you can do audio only, um, you can even do chat only, that's fine, it's really up to you. Um, we try to make these as comfortable as possible, so I should note that we don't record any of them, they're, they're more just for the moment uh, when you want to drop in and talk about something. Um, sometimes there's library topics, sometimes they're, um, you know, off the topic a little bit, what are you reading, what are you, um, what are you doing to relax, that type of thing. So um, just, I'm going to put these, uh, again, I'm going to put these links in the chat box. Um, I'll also put my email in there. So if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, so I think our next presenter is going to be Anna Beam, who is um, going to present on Rails e-resources uh, available to everyone in the state of Illinois. Anna, are you there? I am. Thank you, Dan. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, like Dan and everybody else has said, it's so great to see everybody here. So, you know, thank you for, for being here. Um, I, I'm the e-content specialist at Rails, um, and I, I, um, I know that a lot of libraries are really focusing these days on services they can provide to their patrons remotely. Um, and so a lot of libraries are really ramping up their digital offerings, and I've seen a few things come up in the chat about that already. And so um, I wanted to take a, a few minutes to talk about one of the resources that we provide at Rails that is available to everybody in the state, um, and that is the BiblioBoard Library. So it's an e-content resource that you have access to right now. Um, it is a very robust resource. We um, at Rails, we really love this resource um, for a lot of reasons, and I'll kind of go through that real quick. Um, for one, there are over 20,000 ebooks available to you right now via BiblioBoard. Um, they include uh, high quality independently published novels, um, a collection called Indie Author Project Select, which are self published ebooks that have been vetted by library journals, so really high quality reads. Um, you're also going to see a collection of self-published books that are by uh, Illinois authors. It's called Indie Illinois. They're by writers right in your very own community. Um, and that includes uh, the ebooks the e by the soon to be famous Illinois Author Project winners. Um, so lots of really high quality things that you can be reading right now. Uh, the Biblio Board Library also includes classic books, things that um, are, are uh, sort of perpetually popular um, and things that have come back uh, into focus, for uh, example, uh, the novel Little Women uh, or Emma, things that are currently um, have become uh, remade as films recently. We've seen some renewed interest in these materials and so those are available via BiblioBoard. There's also a really large collection of educational resources and books for school age students, both in English and in Spanish um, that you can access. Um, and a collection called Pop-Up Picks, which is a rotating collection of front list titles. Um, this quarter includes activity books for kids and for adults. So if you're at home um, looking for things to do, you'll find some books on crafting and activities there, graphic novels, poetry, stuff like that. Um, one of the reasons that we think this resource is so great, not just because of the content that's in there, um, but because everything in BiblioBoard is available all the time. So these are simultaneous use titles. These are things that um, are available to everybody. Uh, no holds, no waits. You're never going to see one of those messages that says, you know, uh, you'll get this book in approximately six months or whatever. These are things that are available all the time. Um, so that is one of the reasons that we, we really love Biblia Award. Um, another reason that we really love it is that it's geolocated to the entire state of Illinois, which means that everybody who is physically within the state of Illinois um, can access these resources. Users do not need to log in um, and they do not need to have a library card to, to get access to these ebooks that I just talked about. Um, and so it's a really exciting resource for that reason. Um, so to recap, uh, everyone in Illinois has access to over 20,000 ebooks and more all the time, um, which sounds pretty great. Uh, so I, I get the question a lot of times, you know, how, how, do, how does my library sign up for this? How do I access these ebooks? 
Um, and the good news is, is that you don't have to sign up for it as a library. You have this right now. All you have to do um, to access the BiblioBoard library is either download the app. Um, so there is a BiblioBoard app that you can add to your phone or to your, your tablet or whatever. Um, or you can access the, this collection via the internet, via the website. Um, and that URL is library.biblioboard.com. Um, one of the questions that I get often is that when you go to that URL, if you, you go to it right now, you might run into a login page. Um, and, uh, and I just said you don't need to, to log in to access these materials. On that login page, uh, you are going to see a series of buttons. Um, and we just updated this to make this a little bit more direct, a little bit more accessible to everyone. Um, you're going to see a series of buttons that says, you know, under freely accessible libraries in your area. And one of those buttons is going to say BiblioBoard Library of Illinois. Um, that's all you need to do is you just need to click on that button to get access to uh, the resources. And it'll take you directly into BiblioBoard. And from there, you can just start, you know, clicking and reading uh, ebooks right away. Um, the only thing we ask, all you need to do to provide this resource to your patrons uh, is to add a link to the BiblioBoard Library on your website, um, along with your other e-content resources add this link to your website, make these resources available to your users. Um, we've also included a link that is available on, we've created a whole list of uh, free or discounted e-content resources. Um, that list is on the Rails website and it is also linked on that COVID-19 Pulse page. Um, and so you can go there and find uh, all of these resources uh, right then and there. Um, so that's that's my, my spiel about BiblioBoard. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to to answer them right now. Um, otherwise, feel free to shoot me an email at any time. My email address is also on that list of free ebook resources. And I think I'm passing it back off to Monica, I believe. So Monica, I think you're back up. Actually, can I pop in real quick? Yes, you can pipe in. <laughs> so we also have some um, the some lists about some e-content um, offering, some virtual um, virtual tours and things like that. And um, one library, Schomburg, had a really great way of using these resources. So um, they are taking that big empty Communico feed that's on their homepage and they're replacing it with a list of their, some virtual programming they're doing as well as some things that could be pulled from some of the lists we've provided too. So um, for instance, today, and they just actually started posting this today, and they have um, hand lettering for beginners today, watch now per afternoon, take a tour of the Martian surface. Um, so just a fun way to kind of make that events feed that is on everybody's homepage be a little more exciting. And in addition, um, they have created a kindness calendar. They, um, every day they've got something um, to do um, to, to be kind. And they're also linking to that from, um, from their, this news feed. So I just thought that was a great idea and something positive during all of this time and a way to use some of the e-resources that we have. So um, with that, I'll pass that on to Monica. Thank you, Layla. Um, just a couple of things we wanted to note, of course, uh, this is a great time to promote the census. Uh, we all know that the census is coming up and that a lot of people are at home. And so several libraries are also finding ways to promote the census through video and other marketing pieces. So if you're looking for new ways to engage with your community, don't forget about the census. Uh, it's an important time, you know, for us all to be looking at that as well. Uh, the only other thing that we wanted to note is that what you will find uh, on the Pulse page uh, that that under the other resources section, there is a link to uh, Illinois AmeriCorps for places to donate uh, personal protective equipment that are needed during the time of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of school districts and some libraries we've heard from are looking at materials that they are not using that are currently in need and finding ways to donate those. So if you are looking uh, to connect with a group that is looking to donate that equipment, we just wanna note again that that resource is available to you on the Library Pulse page so that you can see that there as well. I think that is all I have, unless there are any questions for any of our presenters. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I can see in the chat that uh, 
a lot of um, what has been talked about has been put uh, um, has been put in the chat. And um, I just want to remind you, if you <laughs> haven't already gotten the message, we have a very robust page there, our Pulse page on COVID-19. There's a lot there. We're updating it all the time. So please go there um, to find uh, information about everything you've heard. I saw also that the, um, um, the, the survey is already being populated, the survey about virtual services, so that's really great. Um, and I, I wanna say, I, you know, I'm sure all of you were as well. I was just, it's so inspiring to hear all the things that everybody is doing and it's just, it just you know proves my point that you know we are such a strong network we are not closed we are open that is the message that we want to tell people um so um i did want to say uh, a few more words about um uh, monica mentioned the census yes the census which of course at one time was like you know front really front of mind uh well it's still out there one of the good things about being at home perhaps is that you don't have enough to do well fill out your census form so i'm hoping that that will um, certainly be the case um, of course a lot of our set of the census programming that was being planned uh, uh, particularly as part of the rails project uh, was very much related to you know meeting people where they were laundromats you know malls apartment buildings none of that's happening um, uh, switching over very much to social media um, and um, um, uh, Amy, our census project manager, is continuing to have her weekly meetings with the subrecipients. Everybody's doing great, just having to do it in a different way. So um, uh, thanks to everybody who's working on that. Um, I also did want to say a couple more things about um, what uh, Rails is doing. We are going to be having um, our um, a couple of our regular meetings this month. Um, we did get really good advice from Julie Tappendorf last week about um, how to comply with the Open Meetings Act, um, uh, doing a virtual meeting. And what she told us was that um, we can, you know, that, that certainly for the, the, you know, as far as far as until until further notice, uh, virtual meetings are legal, but there are some things to keep in mind. Um, at the top of the agenda, you need to note very specifically that it that it is a virtual meeting that it's either and either call and you know what the call in access or other access information should be given. Um, you don't want anybody trying to come to the meeting physically when it's a virtual meeting. Uh, it's also very important to make it clear how people can participate because you still need to have public comment. So whether that's from you know calling or chatting like here, uh, you know that's up to you. But you need to make all this information very clear. Um, and also, she recommends only do essential business. Again, you know, as, as we know, Open Meeting Act, it's all about transparency. So if you really don't need to do something right now in a virtual meeting, don't do it. Wait until you, um, you, you can have a regular physical meeting that, that people can be at. Um, any questions about that? Is it sufficient to put the agenda on the web if in the past you posted it in the lobby? I would assume so. Yes, that's... The, and you know any other chan any other I guess social media channels that you might have, and I guess there's no problem with you know putting it on the door as well if you can. Yeah, I think a lot of these are are hybrid. I I know I've heard of that in other libraries. So anyway, um, that information is also um, um, in that it's in the webinar that was recorded um, and. Uh, you know, we're happy to um, answer any more questions about that, or if you have questions that Julie hasn't answered yet, we're happy to ask her. Um, so I, th oh, I, there's just a couple other things that I wanted to say. Um, yes, mental health is extremely important. I, you know, I'm sure that most of you have employee assistance programs. I wouldn't forget to tell staff of, and yourselves about those. If, you know, those, they offer the kind of assistance in uh, in these you know uh, stressful situations um, that could be very helpful. We are using Zoom with our staff. We're having 
uh, by bi-weekly, I think it's the right word, semi, anyway, twice a week, sort of virtual meetings on Zoom to just sort of hang out and talk to each other. Um, again, this is a time when technology can really be helpful. So I encourage you all to think about that as well. We, we have to take care of each other, our staff and our communities. Um, question about governor's order eliminated the in-person quorum, but it did not waive about having a policy to allow a board member to phone in. Yes, you can still have a board meeting via Zoom as far as I understand it. Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, hear from Betsy Adamowski and then Kate Hall about some very specific issues that they've been dealing with in their libraries um, that I think will be, I know will be very informative for all of us. You wanna take it, Betsy? Oh, you're muted. All right, there you can go. you hear me? This yes. Night. Okay, good. Awesome. Very good. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see your faces. I can see I'm starting to turn white. Um, and I'm like, oh my God. Um, so I actually wrote out my remarks. Those of you who know me know that I tend to ramble and I tend to go on. And I really wanted to make sure that I said my key things in what I wanted to discuss. So with that, I have everything written down here, so bear with me while I actually read, which is the first time for me. So Dee asked me to say a few words because the Wheaton Public Library was put into a unique position of having to define its essentialism on day one. Now, I was in Arizona when this all went down. So for seven days, I worked full time from the hotel room um, with email and phone with the city manager as well as the library board president. Um, and so what some of you are dealing with now, I dealt with from day one. And I think that's why Dee asked me to speak with you. So I, I also want you to understand this is not a negative situation for me. Um, the city of Wheaton and I have, the library has a good relationship. We have a very good relationship, but we struggle as a city library, as most city libraries do, because we are embedded in the city's budget. So if the city gets hit, the library gets hit. And how we address, how we address that going forward is important, but I think all of you need to address that because right now you are all, you are all collecting taxes. So. With that being said, um, I think that it's important that you understand that um, while, the, while the city funds the Wheaton Public Library, um, we personally moving forward have to start thinking in terms of one budget, one city. So when the governor declared its stay at home um, executive order and did not include the libraries in the essential definition, but include the city government, there was an immediate response by some of the city employees of Wheaton as to why are the library workers at home not working and getting paid when they have to go into the city um, building and work. It was understandable, but frustrating for me as some of the leaders out there know, because I immediately started emailing them for help. Um, however, as I advocate and preach to you all on advocacy, um, you better get your elevator speeches ready. And boy, did that ever work for me right now. Um, basically, I was able to quickly respond that the Wheaton Public Library staff, is they're not city workers. They have different benchmarks, they have different policies, they have different days off, they have different benefits that the city workers have. I am telling you this again, as, we, as this stay at home executive order continues to be extended, you will also need to be justify what your actions are that you are taking as you continue to operate your library as it is closed. Some of you still have your book drop open. And I think we need to ask, is that essential? 
Is it essential that you bring staff into the library to empty the book bins? It is, is it essential uh, to have to promote that people leave their homes to drop a library book off at the library? That is not defined as essential. So these things I had to think of from day one because my first thought was leave the book drops open, they can, they can return their books. And when that executive order came out, we closed the book drops within the hour um, because it's not essential. And so moving forward, what really happened was that I started to use the word essential and as I, as I continued on. So maybe that is something that you might want to think about. Um, the other thing is that I know that people might ask why, if my business is closing, my children are being told to go on unemployment, I myself have to go on unemployment, why are the library staff still paying their employees for staying at home, many of whom are not working at home? While these right now are hypothetical questions to many of you, but they came to me on day one. Day one, I, I like all of us, oh, we'll be open, we'll pay our staff, this is gonna be fine. Oh no, that didn't go very well with the city manager um, and also my board president who unfortunately got hit pretty bad um, within her business. So I need to start to think about it. Thankfully, I was able to justify paying my staff because I needed to buy time to build a virtual library. I was not ready to declare who can work from home and who could not. Also, I was not really clear on how long this executive order was gonna last. It was more cost effective, in my opinion, to stay status quo than try to start dismantling wages, and benefits, et cetera. It is important to note that I did immediately, like I said before, start to input that word essential into everything that I did. And in right now, the word essential is absolutely so critical. So at the Wheaton Public Library, my first huge task two weeks ago was to build a virtual library. And this took time, equipment had to be found. I had staff members who didn't even have Wi-Fi in their home, which blew my mind. Um, I had to build the job tasks, I had to build the programs, programs had to be defined and developed and staff had to be identified who will work from home and who will not. As of today, all that work is done, thank God. It took a full week of meetings, planning, brainstorming and development and thankfully my management staff was on board 100%. Tonight, I have a special board meeting so for those of you who need to know how to build an agenda, you can look on the Wheaton Public Library's website to see what my agenda looks like. Um, tonight we have a special board meeting. Um, we are going to approve allowing all residents within the school district 200 boundaries to have library cards until September 1st. Our hope is that we will see more library cards being applied for and that the unincorporated residents just might stay with us after September 1st. We will also be approving a resolution that gives me the executive order to pay bills so that we do not have to have a board meeting. Most of us have board meetings just to approve the paying of the bills. So I will have executive power to do that. And that was a resolution by the mayor, the city mayor. Lastly, we, we will be approving paying the staff until April 7th. Friday, April 3rd, we will have a second special meeting to discuss a plan for what happens after April 7th. This will be done in executive session as we will be discussing individual employees. Basically what's happening is that I have a virtual library staff and a non-virtual library staff. And the question is, is how do you pay a non-virtual library staff to sit home and watch Netflix all day while the virtual library staff is literally putting in a full day's work with a timesheet, with um, a job description, and with everything else that comes in with um, guidelines and so forth. So therefore, this week, I need to get in place such things as, can I cut wages, 
but keep medical benefits? Can I stop accruals of a vacation and PTO time? Um, I have to develop a work at home procedure guide. Um, I have to figure out the Illinois Reimbursement Act. Thank you, Kate, who's gonna be talking about that in a minute. Next week, I plan to build a, a plan to build a plan um, on how to open the library when we finally can. And I'm not even going to get into that because I think that's going to be another Rails member update topic. So in sum, the lessons that I've learned that I really want to get out to you right now, and this is just for me, from my library, in my, no, we're not cookie cutter, I get that, but these are just words of advice that I would give when I do advocacy training. Know your library and be ready to defend the actions you are taking. Don't just say, oh, like me, oh, well, all the other libraries are closed and so we're going to close. That's not going to work. You have to make sure you define why and how you're going to do it. Do you have a special fund on how you're paying these people and so forth? Keep your whole board up to date on things. I use my library board president and with her and me, we communicated to the rest of the board as she felt necessary. Remember, your library board is still one in the library and you still report to them. Contact your city manager, your mayor, or whomever is, is the head of your, your community to keep them updated as to what the library is doing. Communicate with your park district managers, superintendent of schools, et cetera, to make sure you are in line with what they are doing. I found that out. I came home Tuesday night um, off the airport, Wednesday morning at eight o'clock in the morning, had a meeting with the park district and the superintendent and the city manager, and find out that the um, park district was probably gonna not pay wages at all. So I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think you know, that that was possible. I'm not sure what they ended up doing, but that was definitely something he was considering. Be ready to defend how you are managing and paying your staff. Stay informed with the executive orders, the stay at home rules and laws and the employee rights um, and labor laws. Document everything. I went out and bought a new, a new book to document things. I actually even have another calendar that's just COVID-19 calendar. Communicate with your staff and most importantly, stay in touch with your friends or organization if you have one. They are your advocates right now. If you keep them in touch, then they will be able to spread the word as to what you're doing and what your plans are. So all these things I did two weeks ago, I, you are just still, some of you are just starting them now. So I just thought maybe they would help you to hear some of that. So that, that's what I have. So thank you Dee for inviting me and good luck to everyone. We really are, this is an opportunity we're building virtual libraries. We, we have an opportunity to get some new users. And I, I think that if we grab it, we're gonna take this crisis and make it an opportunity for us. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Betsy. First of all, there's a lot of thank yous, a lot of great information. People are re really got a lot out of what you said. But there is a question. How are you managing the executive session, separate Zoom session and recording? Okay, so the um, so this the going into closed session is basically what it is. Okay, so tonight we if you if you go to the Wheaton Public Library, I think you'll see the agenda there. I know it's at the city of Wheaton's. So if you look at the agenda, you will notice um, the first part of it. And to be honest with you, I stole a lot of it from the College of DuPage um, because my board president is the secretary of the College of DuPage um, trustees. So. Uh, I have that as well, thank God. So if you, if you look, you will see I have an introductory paragraph. We have, it is a Zoom meeting. They are going to, there's an email that they can email. Um, yeah, <laughs> hooray, COD, I see. <laughs> um, you can, um, you, there's an email where people are, can email in their comments and then I will take them and I will read them out loud. Now, College of Page says they're not reading their comments out loud because they're probably going to get 200. I'll be lucky if I get one. We'll see. Um, we're going to figure that out tonight. Uh, tonight will be the first time. And um, so it's a Zoom just like this. My board will be uh, on screen, but anybody dialing in will not be. Um, and we're just going to take it from there. I have no idea how this is going to work. <laughs>
Who knows? We'll live and learn. Yes, live and learn seems to be the uh, the uh, the mantra for th these days, right? Um, that was really really great, Betsy. It's uh, it's very sobering, and um, and you know certainly not everybody is in your situation, but everybody's going to have their own situation. And the you know the more that we can know about what's going on out there, the better we can all be prepared. So thank you. And I know that people are going to want to hear back from you after you, after you do this. So uh, we'll be, I'll be checking in with you again. Okay. Okay. I, you know what, again, everybody, we got this. We yeah. really do. We got this. And I think if we keep that momentum, we're, we're going to be just fine. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yep. Um, as you mentioned, Kate's going to talk to us about another important um, uh, thing that we have to all be aware of and prepared for. You want to take it, Kate? Sure. Thanks, Dee. Um, although I think it is distinctly unfair that Betsy got to go first and I now have to follow that awesome presentation. Who's I, who put the agenda together, Dee? Um, but no, I wanted to talk with everyone um, about some things we've been hearing in some of the webinars that I know many of us have been on and specifically that in January 2019, the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act was amended. Um, I'm, all of us read about it at the time. I was like, well, this is not a thing I have to worry about because I'm not demanding my staff work from home. We had a remote work policy. Um, and, and basically, I'm gonna, read, I'm gonna read some of the statute. Um, I'm also gonna paste it in the comments, which is what I accidentally did before when I was trying to get things prepped while Betsy was talking. Um, so it says that an employer shall reimburse an employee for all necessary expenditures or losses incurred by the employee within the employee's scope of employment and directly related to services performed for the employer. An employer is not liable under this section unless the employer authorized or required the employee to incur the necessary expenditure or the employer failed to comply with its own written expense reimbursement policy. Um, so like, that's a lot of words. Um, basically what it means is that if we are requiring staff to work from home, we have to pay them for the things that they are using in their home, like data if they're making phone calls or internet if they're on Zoom meetings or paper if they're printing things. Um, I've spoken with both um, H, the HR attorneys at HR Source, um, as well as our general counsel attorney at Ansel Glink, Britt Isley. Um, both have said, yep, you guys definitely have to pay for this. <laughs> and so I was like, great, so there must be a formula somewhere, right, that I can apply. Um, and so guess what, there isn't. Um, so I have put one together with huge thanks to Rebecca Malinowski, the CCS Executive Director, who did this, because her staff does do remote work regularly. So she'd figured all of this out, and I basically just stole it and adapted it for my library. So huge kudos to Rebecca. I know she's out there somewhere. Um, I, however, this is a significant financial burden. When I ran the numbers, um, my library, we're not asking everyone to work from home, but we are asking a lot of people to work from home, anywhere from 25 to 50% of their regularly scheduled hours. Um, it's gonna cost us, depending on what, how much people are working from home and what they're asking them to do, anywhere from 1,000 to $3,500 a month. Um, to pay for these services. Um, so as we're grappling with some of these big questions that Betsy mentioned, we also have to think about how are we going to pay people? How is this going to work? How are we going to do this? I re reached out to my local legislator and said, hey, this is like big <laughs> and I think a lot of people aren't aware of it. Can we do something about it? Um, so she, she is um, working with other legislators throughout the state and um, especially on the North Shore where I'm at um, to try and have something pass with this. Um, we do want to be careful because right opening up legislation can lead to all sorts of unintended consequences as I'm sure Diane Foote um, and the PPC, the Public Policy Committee can tell us. Um, so what I'm hoping for is that we can get all of our legislators to get on board with doing a um, pause on this requirement right now. Um, but if that doesn't happen, then please know that you will have to do this. I've prepared a letter that I'm gonna send out on the directors only listserv later today um, for any legis for any director that wants to talk to their local legislator about this and ask them to consider 
hitting the pause button while we are in this crisis. Um, I'll also include the spreadsheet. Again, I can take no credit for it. It's Rebecca Malinowski's. I've just adapted it for my own use. And so you are welcome to put your own numbers in there and figure out what you're asking your staff to be doing. Um, and just recognizing that this is yet one more thing we have to put on our plates. Um, my biggest concern with all of this um, is also the small businesses. And I want to call out Megan Millen from the Joliet Public Library. I know she is on the call. I reached out to her last week and was like, Megan, we got to do something about this. Can you help me? And she was 100% all in. So she has already talked to her legislators down in Joliet, as well as getting someone in touch with the CEO. Because um, for small businesses that are asking people to work remotely, this is a significant financial burden. Not to say that it isn't for us, but even more so for these small businesses. So this is something that is challenging and that we're looking at. So feel free to reach out to me. I know um, Diane Foote has it on the PPC agenda for April 6. Um, so it will be going to the Public Policy Committee with ILA to look at as well. Um, and so I see that there were some questions. I'm going to start with the latest one, which is from Leighton. Um, if they get 100% pay for 50% work, then can't that cover expenses? I specifically asked our attorney about that, both of them, and they said no. <laughs> it has to be, um, yeah, it has to, it has to be done through the, um, it, you have to pay them separately, and it has to be a separate line on the paycheck. Um, I don't know, do we have anyone D from, is Catherine or Kelly on from HR Source? Because they might also be able to answer. Um, I'm going to just keep going through the questions. Ross Shanley Roberts asked, so I don't get 240 plus emails. Thank you for that. Um, where can we get this spreadsheet? I am going to send it out. If you are on the directors only listserv, I will send it out. Um, I don't know if D, you want to toss it up in the COVID page. Yes, she's sure. going to toss it up on the Pulse page. Um, so it'll be there as well. Um, let me just see. Um, Gwen Gregory was asking if this applies to state employees. Gwen, when I read the law, it applies to all employees. So yes, I'm presuming, but obviously I'm not an attorney. I'm a librarian. So check with your attorney. Um, and and the, if the Secretary of State, um, okay, Sarah said if the Secretary of State rep is still on, I don't know if Karen or Greg are still on, it might be worth approaching, I don't know, know what CMS is. I probably should for reimbursement. Central Management Services. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think that those might be, um, oh, okay, Carol Metal asked, how did I determine the payment to be from 1,000 to 3,500 per month? Um, so if you guys give me a second, and if it's okay, Dee, if we have a minute, I can, you know what? I'm not gonna pull it up on the screen. I feel like that would be too much. Carol, um, again, Thanks to Rebecca Malinowski. Rebecca's going to give me grief for mentioning her name so many times, probably. <laughs> um, but don't go, you know, banging on Rebecca's door. But basically, she took um, data on how much it is for average internet accounts and average data plans. And then I applied the percentage that we're asking staff to work to come up with flat amounts. Um, so I have a flat amount for data, and I have a flat amount for internet, which is $10 for data, $15 for internet, which equates to $25 per person per month if they're using both of those services. So I think, um, yeah, we'll, we will ask if uh, CMS, Central Management Services in Springfield has anything. Um, I, I think that this, obviously this has raised a lot of questions as we knew that it would. So we will see if we can get some um, some additional information sort of offline here and you know continue posting um, answers to the questions. Obviously, you can send Kate or Rebecca 240 emails. Um, they probably appreciate that, but um, thank you. Uh, you know, the main thing here is we want to obviously want to raise your awareness of this, and thank you, Kate, for explaining it so clearly. This is not a new law. Um, I think it was passed when the minimum wage increase was passed, if it, I believe that's correct. It doesn't, it hasn't really um, been on library screens that much until now, uh, so for obvious reasons. So let us see what we can find out about it and um, 
we will get that out to you both on the director's list and on the on our web page if that makes sense great thanks steve i'm going to go back to muting myself <laughs> okay thank you kate uh, so that in, that concludes the you know formal part of the agenda um and here's a message from Diane. Um, please be cautious reaching out to legislate. Right. That I think that's that's kind of where I was going to. Thanks, Diane. We we need to get a better sense of um, what the you know the impact of this is, how it affects not just libraries but other organizations, so that we don't you know get ourselves in an awkward position. Yes, there are already exceptions. So let's let's just. Uh, um, Let's try to get some of these questions answered and be sure that we have a, you know, a go forward plan that will work for as many of us as possible. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so are there are there questions that about anything, Mary, that we haven't gotten to over the course of the update? Well, we just had a couple came in. There's one about um, what about new emergency sick pay bill? And then there's something about a draft plan of a gradual reopening. I know we talked about readdressing the reopening issue in the future, but I don't know uh, about the emergency sick pay bill. I don't either. I have not heard about that. Has anybody else heard about the emergency sick pay bill? I would. It's a new FMLA bill, we're told here. Yes. Okay, thanks, Diane. Yes, um, that's um, huge. They extended the Family Medical Leave Act, um, and you all need to be aware of that. And they talked about it at the last, um, yeah, oh, the Family right. First Act. Thank you, you guys. Yes, you need, oh. to, you need to look at that, and you need to make sure that all your employees get a copy. So we actually mailed it out to every single um, employee. I had a cover letter to it. Um, it's very, it's very, very important. There's also even a, weirdly so, you got a, like a poster, like where are we gonna put that? Right. So, um, we're gonna put it on our intranet um, and I'm gonna be talking about that today because I have a team meeting today at 1.30. So um, you may wanna get it and just literally put it in your snail mail um, to make sure that all your employees get it. Yes, I re I do remember that now. I see that our HR, some of our staff has uh, weighed in on that. Yes, so that was part of the uh, stimulus package. Family, yeah, exactly. I don't know about the size. I'm going to assume that it's. Well, I don't know. We can certainly read the bill and find out. Other questions or comments at this point? Anything from Rails staff that you think that we should cover at this point? Under 500 people on staff are required to fall all the way down to one employee. Okay, well, makes sense. Well, it's 11.30. We've certainly been through a lot of important stuff today. Um, I don't think that um, I don't think it's time to start about gradually reopening. Unfortunately, I it's I I just think we have I think we got to stay in the phase that we're in um, and think about I um, um, you know as you know things about these laws that we have to follow um, you know materials handling um, paying staff taking care of of uh, staff, you know, worrying about what's going to happen to uh, tax revenue, obviously. So it'll be, it'll, there'll be time, um, you know, at some point to talk about reopening, but not yet. I think, Dee, if I could just interject something, one yep. thing that I, um, you know, some kind of out of the game, but um, <clears throat> don't be so confident that all your staff's gonna come back. I think you may have some staff that may be afraid to come back. They've had this time now at home. <laughs> they may, um, so I, am, I have that definitely front and center. Um, also be comfortable with, if you can't open fully, 
because of lack of staff or what have you, that's okay. It took me about a week and a half to come to that consensus. The community will understand. Um, and you made the soft opening where no tables and chairs and, you know, literally only soft checkouts, only, you know, things like that. But you may want to start thinking about looking at your staff and kind of thinking some of those older staff members might not come back. So just keep that in your mind. Right. I, I agree. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, th this will end, but that doesn't mean it's going to go back to like it was. It's going to be a different world. And we can't even imagine all the ways it's going to be different yet. So we just have to, as I keep saying, sorry, but we've got to stick together. Um, we have a great community and we, and as you said, Betsy and Kate, I think, you know, we got this. So, so I think, um, we will conclude and obviously we'll have another one of these when it seems like we have, you know, when we should, when we have enough to say, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, in the meantime, you know, um, you know, uh, Dan's uh, water cooler meeting is on Thursday. We have, you know, lots of other great things going on. Um, there's the, uh, right after this at noon, our time is the, um, the webinar from IMLS on materials. Um, so I know a lot of people have been signed up for that and we'll, we'll see what happens after that. So um, in the meantime, take care everybody, stay strong, stick together, have some fun, get out, take a walk, um, read a book, <laughs> read an ebook. Um, you're all awesome. So um, see you soon, I'm, I'm sure. Thank you everyone.